Hi, and welcome to our session on pre-planning, scope, and vision. We're covering three topics today uh, in that order. Pre-planning first, where we're looking at setting ourselves up to develop a plan. Then we're looking at scope, deciding where the plan applies to. And then finally, we'll look at vision, uh, setting a broad, long-term view for where our plan needs to go. So pre-planning first. As it says here, pre-planning, planning to plan. So in our experience, our ability to put a plan into practice begins now in the work that we do to think about how our process is going to work. And so we want to think about that a bit. Uh, this adaptive management course uh, for conservation training is supported by the UNDP uh, with GEF financing and it's presented by Conservation Management Community Solutions and the Blue Mountains World Heritage Institute. We are in the conservation standards of course and we're up in step number one, assess and we're in the purpose and team step where we really think about what is what is it that we're trying to do what's the purpose of this process and who needs to be in it but we do think about a few other things as well so why do we do this pre-plan step why plan to plan we do it for several reasons to make sure that the work that we're doing achieves what we're trying to achieve. So we want to get a rough work plan together to, that sets out how we're going to do our planning. And it helps us to think about what we need, what we need other people to do, and the amount of work that's going to be required. We also think about capacity. Do we have the materials and skills that we need to do this? And how are we going to get those if we don't? It helps us to be really clear with ourselves and with others why we want to do this. And it helps us to identify who really needs to be involved. Done well, making a plan can take quite a bit of time and money. And so it's really important that we think about doing this properly so that we don't you know, waste people's time and the resources that we get the job done as best we can. The living management plans guidelines um, that have been developed uh, previously recommend some additional points to think about. Um, you need to think about the process that you're going to use being relevant and useful and practical in the Papua New Guinea context. It can't be too expensive and it can't be too complicated. We think the conservation standards fits that need. The second key point is that, of course, if people have been involved, then they're more likely to support what happens at the end if people have been involved throughout. That's certainly been my very uh, lived experience with the healthy country planning approach by involving communities very closely in the design of the process and the doing of the process plans don't just sit on the shelves, they get used. And we also need to understand approvals. How is this going to be approved and how do we uh, involve those people right from the start? It's really important when we think about how we're going to do this, that uh, we use culturally appropriate processes, you know, ones that fit in with the community that we're working with. So we often encourage, before you get into the planning process, having meetings with the other community you're going to work with, talk to them about how the process is going to work for them and with them, and what changes you might need to make to fit in with their approaches. In the Australian context and in many other places, it's important to have male and female facilitators because 
that's more culturally appropriate. We take lots of photographs, we record lots of things. Uh, in other places you might draw lots of pictures, but we, we do take lots of photographs. And we allow time in the process for people to look at what was said in meetings, think about them and, and answer and give you some responses back. There are some steps that are a bit more complicated than others in planning and making plans. And so we encourage the development of a smaller team to work on those complicated steps and have larger community meetings for general steps. The other thing we encourage is that don't just turn up in a community on the day you want to start working with them. Get to know people first, build relationships first. So you know, don't make your first meeting with the community your first workshop. Um, we tick through a bit of a list of a few things to think about um, that we really encourage you to, to look at. So be clear about purpose. So when you're sitting down with people and thinking about how this is going to work, why are you doing a plan? Um, it is surprising the number of times when people think they know why they're doing it, but they're not clear when you actually ask them. Who needs to be involved? What are the different roles in making this happen? So there'll be uh, usually a, a coordinator, somebody who's actually getting this all to occur. Uh, you'll have facilitators, but there might also be a few other people who help you become and they're a bit of a team. They form a bit of a team. So some technical experts, uh, some people who know the community well, some people who know the environment well. Sometimes you'll have a sponsor or a funder or somebody like that who is involved more closely and of course partners. So think about who needs to be involved and when. Not everybody needs to be involved all the time. Then of course, how are you going to do the planning? What will be the level of engagement? Um, are all the steps in the process going to be done with everybody? Or will some steps be more participatory? That is, you'll have more community engagement with those and other steps can be done by a small group. Will there be training involved? We find that it's good to train some community people to understand how the process works so they can work with you more closely. Of course, we do a timeline, what needs to happen and when. And of course, Certainly our experience is the timeline gives you an idea of what's going to happen, but you need to be able to be flexible and have that timeline adjust. What do we think needs to come out at the end? And again, what's our capacity? Have we got the resources to do this ourselves? We'll often end up with something like this, a bit of a, a map to say, oh, well, we'll start with this kind of meeting and then you know, a month later or two months later, we'll do these meetings and then We'll get together again. So we, we make a bit of a process map just to give people an idea of when things are going to happen. This one's from quite a big planning process with a lot of communities, so it's probably a bit more going on than maybe you might otherwise do, but it's a really good way of making sure everybody involved knows what needs to happen and when. When you think about products, of course, think about lots of different kinds of products. So there's a traditional sort of plan, a paper plan, um, but we also do posters, which are the three diagrams on the right hand side. Um, some groups have turned their plans into videos, which have been really good, particularly um, where um, you're trying to tell a story you know, in different languages and show people what's happening rather than expecting people to read. Again, the, the guidelines from um, that have been developed for, for New Guinea also suggest different types of products. So think about websites, printed documents, plans, posters, things like that. There's also the, um, you know, you can do models whatever, you know, different, different things that communicate to people are really worth thinking about. Then I've mentioned a couple of times that we need to think about capacity. And so we go through a, a short exercise 
to really think about what is our capacity um, you know do we have um, the resources that we need and the skills that we need and there's a very simple capacity assessment tool in the conservation standards or connected to it which looks at these six areas do we have someone to lead do we have a good team is there good organizational support do we have funding do we have a good legal framework to do the things that we need to do and does the community support it it's a very simple tool but it gives us a way of thinking about whether we're ready to start if we think that we're mostly low for those things then maybe we need to do some capacity building before we do the process if we're mostly towards the high then maybe we can get started so it's a, it's a useful thing to think about. Just some last points. Uh, so for pre-planning, make sure you establish clear goals, respect people's time and uh, knowledge uh, that they bring to the process. Make sure you have enough facilitators and co-facilitators so that everybody can participate properly. Give plenty of time for review and feedback. If you do that too quickly, then uh, you'll just um, you know, not, not give people enough time to think about what's being done. Think about where you're going to do your planning. Sometimes you might be in a town or village community. Sometimes you might want to go outside somewhere. Um, think about using small groups on complicated steps. You might think of other things that might be important uh, for your uh, situation. The key thing that we really want to, to reinforce here is preparation is the key. And the more you think about this now, who needs to be involved, why should they be involved and things like that, then the more likely it is that you'll get good adoption of the plan when it's completed. So that's pre-planning. Once you've really got your pre-plan thought about and you're ready to get started, the first main steps that we, we do in the conservation standards are our scope and our vision. So as you can see, they're very still part of the assess step. So the very first step, and they're the next thing. We've got our purpose and team sorted out. Now we need to think about scope and vision. So we'll talk about scope first, then we'll talk about vision. So what is what does scope mean? Scope really is just saying where are we making this plan for? Uh, so defining the boundary of our project, that doesn't mean it has to be a hard line on a map. It just needs to be clear what you mean by where you're working. So we want to define the boundaries um, of the project area that we're thinking about. Now, sometimes those boundaries are set for us. We might have a particular uh, protected area that we have to work inside uh, but sometimes those boundaries might not be so we need to talk about it and it's important to be clear about where you are going to do your planning for as much as where you're not um, so we find it's useful to do this with a number of people but basically work out what the boundary is it might be a property a national park uh, it might be a whole region, so a, a lowland catchment area or highland catchment area, a whole catchment, uh, could be a, like a reef system or something like that. So just a, a region rather than a particular property. Or maybe it's wherever a particular species occurs. So a cassowary, a big bird, a tropical bird, um, we might say, wherever that wherever the cassowary occurs that's where our plan needs to work for so 
species-based planting. Um, or it might be about a particular sort of cultural perspective, you know, cultural landscape, um, more language landscape or traditional landscape. Whichever of those you choose, so either a, a place-based one or a theme, um, coming to some agreement about where the plan is, is really key. In the end, it's useful to draw a map if you can. Um, as I say, it doesn't have to be a sharp line on a, on a piece of paper, but some sort of illustration showing where you think um, you are doing your plan for is really helpful. So you might do that using community mapping. Um, and I think that's you know, something that's really good to do, gets a lot of people involved, um, you know, gets them um, really engaged with the question of where you're doing your thing, uh, your plan for. Um, so, you know, use drawings that don't have to be, um, you know, proper government produced maps that can be community based drawings. Um, it can be very powerful and very useful. Use different sorts of methods to get people involved. And of course, look at background reports. So here's an example where you know, sitting down with a group of people, um, just with in the you know outside on the lands, talking about you know where are we making a plan for, and um, sometimes those conversations can take uh, you know a day or two before you really figure it out. So we're following a case study um, through our sessions, uh, and we're using. Uh, uh, Lake Kutubu as the case study. We've just taken information from um, that plan to illustrate what we mean. And so we'll keep referring to that as we as we go. So if you look at that, um, the plan for that um, area, then they've come up with their, their scope, uh, which is that uh, the boundary on that map. So that's the place that the, the plan is being developed for. And that's really what we're talking about. You know, where do we need to do this um, plan for? Once we know where, then we can start thinking about a vision. Um, and what is the vision? The, the vision is a, about trying to come up with a, an overarching step uh, statement, sorry which talks about what does success look like. If we do this plan and we put it into practice and it worked, what would that look like? What would success look like? And that's really all the vision is. It's about the big idea that points our plan in the right direction. Um, you know, those of you who've done you know, navigation on, on the sea or um, you know, on the land, sometimes when you've got to travel a long distance, you might look at a, a hill a very, very long way away and say, right, we, we're going to go for that. You now you might need to change direction time and time again to cross a river or go around a cliff or something like that, but you always come back to that point on the hill. That's the vision. We want to get to that point on the hill. And this is a really good thing to involve everybody in, the whole community in, to, to get people thinking about what for them success might look like. And a really good way of getting a big conversation about all the things that people want and imagine, getting people excited about the future. So what's a good vision? I mean, in many ways, a good vision is in the eye of the beholder. Whatever is, whatever speaks to you and your project is a good vision. But we say there's three things that are worth thinking about. It should be relatively general. Um, you don't want your vision to be too specific because we want it to include, not exclude. It might sound silly to say, but the vision should be visionary a bit inspiring, uh, encouraging people to, to um, uh, 
engage with what you're trying to do and, and uh, work towards success. And as brief as possible. Sometimes it's not possible to be brief, but as brief as possible. Um, one group that's um, thought about visions a lot has, has developed this sustainability compass, which we find useful um, sometimes to, as a way of thinking about all the different things that might go into a vision. And of course, they're using the, the idea of the points of a compass of the different directions you can you could go in. So you might think, need to think about things to do with nature, economy, society and well-being just as a way of thinking, helping to prompt discussion and think about ideas of what might be a good vision. Uh, sometimes in the projects that we work in, again, uh, you might need to do have a, a conversation with in different culturally appropriate groups. So here we've got men talking together and women talking together. And they come together all together later on, but you know it's important for them to be able to talk separately to start with as they think about what their vision might be. So in this case, a, a plan in, in Northern Australia, they came up with this vision, um, which was about their healthy country plan. It talks about that they'll be looking after their, their country, their lands uh, in the way of their law, their traditional law, that they'll be living on their country and, and so on. So this was their vision. This is what they wanted to achieve and to see in the life of their plan. Uh, this is another one, a really good one. I think Pip was involved in the development of this one from uh, the Yangtze Basin. Again, it's very you know, poetic. Um, it talks about lots of different things, but from the perspective of the community and what they're trying to achieve. You know, a living river linking one place to another people thriving in harmony with nature, different, you know, talks about different animals and different things. Um, it's just a really, you know, it's a beautiful vision. And you read that or listen to it and you think, yeah, that's, that's something I could really get on board with. And again, it's reasonably short, it's reasonably visionary, it's reasonably general, um, it's good. And then from Lake Tubu, you know, that's, this is the vision here, again, really nicely encompassing of uh, all some really um, important points, a bit like on that compass. So practicing culture and traditions, uh, protecting the lake and the rivers, protecting the wildlife and the landscape, but families also living there sustainably, using traditional knowledge and Western science, um, the environment, um, you know, providing for for the community and future generations. A really strong vision um, that talks about the future. Um, there's different ways of building a vision. Um, we use different sorts of tools. Um, again, the, the guidelines for um, protected area planning, got some suggestions in them already. Um, if you, if you um, look at that document, um, it, uses a sort of storytelling approach, which is a really good approach, you know, getting people to talk about what's important, what's special, um, you know, what, what do we want this place to be? And like, you know, drawing maps for, for making, trying to think about scope, um, you know, talking about what's important, what's not important, what we don't want, um, you know, thinking about the places and what they want that place to be like and look like over time. So it doesn't have to be a just a boring sit down conversation. In fact, it shouldn't be. You know, it's a talking about scope and vision is a really good way of getting people uh, involved in thinking about why this is going to occur. So there we go. So that's pre-planning, scope and vision. Pre-planning thinking about why you're doing this, what you want to get out of it, making sure the right people are involved. Scope, where are we doing this for? Making sure we're clear about that. And vision, where do we want this whole thing to, to end up if it's successful? So these are the three big topics that really point this whole thing in the right direction. Okay, thanks everyone.